the region after Syria. And also since 2009, 152 Tibetans have committed self-immolation. They have burned themselves. Now, what is forcing 152 Tibetans to commit self-immolation and burn themselves is an act of desperation and determination calling for freedom for Tibetan people and return of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to Tibet. This is their uh, aspiration. But still, not many people know about these facts. Why? Again, the Reporters Without Borders, as you know, a major international NGO um, based in Paris, uh, says issued a statement based on um, reports uh, of you know, journalists in Beijing. And what they have concluded is that for journalists, it's more difficult to access to Tibet than North Korea. Now, with recent meeting and signing of agreement between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, everybody knows about North Korea, but how many people know about situations in Tibet? Not many, because why? Journalists cannot go to uh, Tibet. And the recent delegation also said, oh, Tibet is free, uh, you know, Canadian members of parliament and government officials can go to Tibet uh, and see for themselves. But I must report to you, even the diplomats, Canadian diplomats in Beijing have such difficulties to travel to Tibet and far less without any restrictions or company of the uh, Chinese government officials manning every visit and you know, who they can see, who they cannot see. So these are the realities of situation in Tibet, uh, situation being you know, uh, second only to Syria and access more difficult uh, than North Korea. Now, in the larger context, politically or ideologically speaking, I think there is a choice in front of us for Canada too. The choice is either you transform China to be more like you, a liberal democracy, or China will transform you. And China is already transforming many countries around the world because I do travel to various capitals uh, around the world and now almost the consensus is either you try to change China or China is transforming you. There's a lot of self-censorship going on, including in European countries. And there's a lot of interference in the domestic politics of many countries. If you look at the debate in Australia, uh, in America, also in Germany, it's not just the commercial investment the Chinese companies and businessmen are making, now also in academia, in politics. For example, in Australia, in a university, Australian professor mentioned Taiwan and Tibet and uh, Tiananmen Square, yes, several professors. And the Chinese students, who are the largest foreign students uh, in Australia, some of them complained against those professors. And what did the university do? University fired those professors. So now Chinese interference is very much present in the academy as well, because academic freedom is what we cherish the most. But the influence and penetration in academia is also very clear. And what does it say? In the larger context, as I said, either you transform China or China will transform you. But Xi Jinping in his 19th Party Congress made it very clear. Xi Jinping's thought is socialism with Chinese characteristic, which means one party rule, no freedom of speech, no uh, democracy. That's what they're bringing to the table in the international forum. Now, either we have to accept that or we have to push back and say liberal democracy is what we cherish, and that's where the Chinese um, uh, government also should follow the direction. And second point, environmentally also, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, and the Chinese government makes a big deal or splash in, in headlines around the world that they want to lead uh, the world on environmental matters. But if you look at the track record of Chinese government's behavior or actions in Tibet, uh, the results are disastrous. Uh, for example, Tibet has around 123 uh, kinds of minerals, gold, copper, uranium, you name it, and all are exploited uh, without much concern to the local culture, local environment, and uh, local people. Uh, for example, lithium. 
uh, is some estimate that 75% of the lithium in China comes from uh, Tibetan area. 90% of the rare earth in China and around the world, some say, comes from Inner Mongolia. Now, I think if you own uh, Chinese-made smartphones, they are very cheap because they use Tibetan lithium. The extraction of lithium is very uh, complicated because you, know, you have to use a lot of heat to uh, extract it from the rocks. Um, uh, but in the process, you pollute the soil, you pollute water, you pollute air. And the Tibetans locally, they don't get anything paid. Uh, but in the process, the land, uh, the water, air of Tibet is polluted. Hence, when you get lithium at such cheap rate without paying anything to Tibetans, when they use it in uh, batteries and smartphones and other gadgets, that makes the Chinese product very cheap. Similarly, they don't pay much to inner Mongolians uh, when they extract uh, rare earth. So that's why Chinese products are uh, very cheap. And environmentally, Tibet is the water tower of Asia. Ten major rivers of Asia flow from Tibet. Uh, you, name, you name any of the major rivers, Indus or Satlaj for you know, India and Pakistan, Brahmaputra for India and Bangladesh, Salvin River, Irrawaddy River, Mekong River, you know, for whole of ASEAN countries, the, life, the lifeline for all of ASEAN countries, all flow from Tibet. Yangtze River. Uh, Yellow River, the cradle of Chinese civilization, uh, flow from Tibet. And Tibet is the water tower for 1.4 billion people. It's that important. And we've been sharing water for the rest of, uh, with all our neighbors for free. Nowadays, we have to pay to buy water in this world, so we've been very generous. Unfortunately, um, Chinese government sits on the water tower of Asia and control the flow of water tower. And Tibet also has 42 thousand major glaciers at the moment. But many scientists have concluded that in the last 70, 80 years, 50% of glaciers have melted and disappeared. Also, NASA says by 2100, remaining 70, 70%, 75% of the glacier will melt and disappear. If those glaciers were to disappear, what will happen to the water tower of Asia? What will happen to 1.4 billion people who depend on fresh water flowing uh, from Tibet. Not just that, underneath uh, the Tibetan glaciers or the Tibetan plateau, like Canada, uh, you know, it's permafrost. And underneath permafrost, there's carbon dioxide and uh, methane. Around 10 million tons of carbon dioxide. If permafrost is to melt with the global warming and the industrialization of Tibetan plateau, with the cutting down of trees, and all the Chinese population moving into Tibetan area, the permafrost is melting. If it is to melt, which is 70% of the Tibetan plateau, if it is to melt, if the carbon dioxide, 10 million tons is released, then I think global warming as we know it will be very different. And methane, 10 million tons of methane is to be released, then which is 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Then even if all the Canadians start walking instead of driving, doesn't help with global warming. So the consequences are disastrous for the whole world. So from environmental point of view, uh, Tibet is a major issue, not just for 6 million Tibetans, not just for Asia, and also uh, for Canada. In fact, uh, scientists in Quebec have said whether the winter in Canada is warm or cold is dependent on the climate changes uh, uh, in the uh, Tibetan plateau because the jet stream over Tibet affects climate in North America, South America, and uh, all the way to uh, Africa as well. So hence, uh, because short of time, I would just like to say ideologically, politically, and environmentally, and historically, uh, Tibet is a major issue for the rest of the world. Let me conclude by saying that what we seek is also very reasonable. Uh, what we seek is support for middle way approach, which is the policy envisioned by His Holiness Dalai Lama and uh, unanimously supported by the Tibetan parliament. That is to seek genuine autonomy as per the Chinese constitution so that Tibet can remain within China. But the autonomy or the rights guaranteed in the Chinese constitution be implemented. So that's very reasonable, and middle way approach does not contradict one China policy. 
Why I say this is, in 2014 and 2016, His Holiness Dalai Lama met with uh, you know, US President uh, Obama, and both times, White House issued a statement, first supporting the middle way approach, but in 2016, not just supporting, but applauding the middle way approach, which means the US government does not see a contradiction between one China policy and middle way approach. Middle way approach essentially is to seek genuine autonomy within China, not seek separation from China, but within China. So this is a moderate, reasonable policy, which is also a win-win policy for uh, China and the Tibetan people. And I hope uh, the you know, Canadian parliament and government will support middle way approach in a way uh, Canada is the ideal partner or advocate for middle way approach or genuine autonomy because Canada actually implements genuine autonomy in many of the provinces within Canada. So even as a friend of China, Canada can say we implement genuine autonomy for uh, you know, different uh, groups in Canada and which is the best way to maintain peace, prosperity, and, est and stability within uh, Canada. And also, you know, uh, which brings, in fact, which strengthens sovereignty of Canada because many provinces of Canada enjoy uh, autonomy as per the Canadian Constitution. So this is a good model uh, for China as well on the issue of Tibet. So with that, I'll conclude my short remark. And I want to thank Chair Bob Nault for you know, um, giving us the platform to share our thoughts uh, on the issue of Tibet. I also want to thank honorable members for spending your precious time uh, uh, to give a hearing on the issue of Tibet. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sangay. And so now, colleagues, we have uh, a good 45 minutes uh, opportunity to ask questions. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Janis, please. Chair, and, and thank you so much, Dr. Sangay, for being with us and, and the whole delegation. Welcome to, uh, to our parliament. Uh, I wanted to make three sort of comments slash questions, and I'll make them all at once, and then I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to you to respond. Uh, I'm not Tibetan, and I don't have very many Tibetans in my riding, but I've been drawn to be involved in support of the Tibet community, uh, in large part because of the nature of the Tibetan struggle uh, and and there's so many things about it that I think people find so impressive. The, the peaceful and optimistic and generous way in which you have engaged the struggle, uh, the openness to compromise, to collaboration uh, that is represented by the middle way approach, and also the way in which uh, you have been preparing institutions uh, through the government in, in exile, which supports the Tibetan diaspora, but also demonstrates the experience of democracy and the readiness of, of Tibetans to take that uh, genuine autonomy. And I would say that I think this is really an example to other peoples around the world who are facing occupation and seeking justice of how to respond generously uh, through, through open-handedness, through peace, and also by building institutions uh, that, that demonstrate a, a readiness for that autonomy. I wonder if you, in that context, could share a little bit about uh, your institutions, the government in exile, and ways that Canada can engage more and support more uh, the government in exile. So that's the, the first point I wanted to make and, and question. Uh, the second is, I was intrigued by this idea as of infrastructure as a possible tool of occupation and oppression. Uh, that's obviously not how we're used to thinking about infrastructure, but I think it's something that we need to be sensitive to when we, uh, when we work on and with infrastructure projects in other parts of the world. So in that context, I'd like to hear your perspective on Canadian involvement in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, because that's something that, that we are discussing and debating and have in this parliament. And then thirdly, uh, there is this myth of the Chinese government uh, trying to pursue dramatic environmental change. I know our, our Prime Minister at one time talked about uh, China's dictatorship allowing them to actually turn their economy around on a dime and say we need to go green. And you've presented us with some evidence to the contrary on that. Uh, so I, I'd appreciate just a little more from you in terms of, of 
this perspective on is China serious about going green or is this uh, kind of a, a branding exercise for the rest of the world to try and improve their image? Over to you. Um, thank you, Honorable uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Gan Jinis. And uh, last time when the so-called delegation from Tibet Autonomous Region came, uh, you spoke uh, very strongly uh, and uh, morally um, that uh, that video has gone viral in the Tibetan world. So I must <laughs> thank you for being an outright uh, spokesperson, even though there is no Tibetan in your writing, which speaks uh, volume and about you that you are actually for justice, freedom, and nonviolence, peace, as you mentioned. I do believe that uh, one cannot say, you know, I am for democracy, I am for human rights, I am for justice, I am for environmental rights, but I cannot speak for Tibet and Tibetan people. If you don't speak out for Tibet and Tibetan people, you are not for human rights, justice, and freedom. So hence, I, we really appreciate your efforts and support for uh, all these years. Um, yes, as far as Tibetan government in exile, as per the vision and guidance of His Holiness Dalai Lama, it is democratic in the real sense. You know, we have parliament, uh, we have judiciary, and we have the executive body, and also the most powerful, actually equally powerful body is also the Auditor General Office. They are very strict when it comes to um, you know spending, and we worry more about our boarding card when we. Uh, you know, uh, get in the plane, then our passport and our bags, because if you don't have boarding card, we don't get refunded. You know, with $300 as our monthly salary, uh, if you don't get refunded for, you know, $1,500 or $600 of airfare, that's three or four months of, uh, you know, salary. So, and I think it, it speaks volume that Auditor General is equally powerful in an exile setup, even though we don't have a police or a military or a prison. What we worry is the noting that we get from the Auditor General Office. There is no fear of going to prison. So hence, this is a labor of love. It's fully democratic. In our election, uh, Tibetans are scattered in 40 countries, including Canada, Toronto, and Ottawa, or Vancouver. They all vote on single day. And it's counted manually, locally, and the election commission in Dharamsala, uh, you know, tabulate everything, and the result is declared. Uh, so hence, you know, it's a uh, uh, democracy without borders. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. And then, interestingly, in Canada, voting is free and you are encouraged. In Tibetan democracy, you have to pay your voluntary freedom tax. It's an oxymoron. If you don't pay your voluntary freedom tax, you don't get to vote. So from 2006 to 2007, uh, 2016, the last 10 years, there is 70% increase in number of voters so among all the democracies in the world, I think it's only Tibetan democracy where there's 70% increase of voter registration who are paying their freedom tax and who are going to uh, the electoral booth to cast their ballots. So it's a beautiful thing that's happening. And uh, you know, equally, we just watched the parliamentary democracy, a uh, parliamentary debate, you know, where Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was addressing some of the questions. I think ours is much more polite. And uh, in, fact, in fact, it's very odd that the members of parliament are uh, with me here together, but you know, our parliament acts both as the opposition and the ruling party. So they support you and sometimes they criticize you. But what they have, I hope our members of parliament will share, they learned a lesson today. In our parliament, our members can ask 10 to 30 questions for 30 minutes to two hours. And we have to answer impromptu right then and there. So here, I think the Prime Minister's you know, question hour is so precious. You have one hour or two hours allocated, right? Ours is like 10 days of questions. So I hope uh, members of parliament will learn something from the Canadian <laughs> parliament procedure. And we have less questions. That's better for executive. So it's also in the true democratic sense. It's very robust. Uh, so we are also very proud. In fact, you're right. Many of the you know, uh, refugees, around 60 million refugees in diaspora, could learn something uh, from Tibetan democracy, how we function. We run our own schools, we run our own monasteries, we run our own settlements, um, and quite successfully so. Um, actually, our literacy rate 
uh, those below the age of 60 is 94%. And India, which is a host country, literacy rate is anywhere from 76% to 82%. So our literacy rate is higher than the host country, better than Nepal, better than Bangladesh, better than many of the neighboring countries, even though we are refugee and in exile. So it's something we are very proud uh, and uh, we are following. And then you're right, infrastructure as a tool of control. Absolutely. You know, one, one road that the Chinese help us build, and of course we help them build also, uh, led to the control and occupation of Tibet. And hence, uh, what you see, uh, obviously at the moment there's a lot of debate with one, bull, uh, one Bell, One Road initiative, whether it's good for the world or not. But as far as Tibetans are concerned, we'll say how, that's how we got control. So infrastructure is definitely uh, as a tool of control and occupation. Uh, hence, whether Canada participate in Asian Infrastructure Bank or not is for you to decide. I will not comment. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, one has to be wise um, uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, uh, China and Chinese government. Uh, we need to go green is the slogan of the Chinese government and Chinese leaders. Are they actually going green or not? I'm pretty sure when they sell their solar panels or other things, you know, they want to say they are going green. But their track record as far as what they're doing in Tibet with the deforestation, uh, mining of all our minerals, where local culture is not respected. For example, some of the sacred mountains and sacred rivers are mined and fished, you see. Uh, I think you might know a case of a Mongolian activist who stood in front of trucks to protest or protect the sacred mountains, you know, but what did the uh, Chinese truck driver do? They just rode over uh, the Mongolian and just killed him. And so they act with impunity uh, in Tibet uh, and in Mongolia as well. So uh, going green, um, I think, as far as we are concerned, I think we go green when Chinese leaders say they're actually going green. We green with, in few, I mean, um, with reservation and anxiousness. So, you know, one has to be very careful. Uh, Dr. Sange and Mr. Jens, we'll go to Mr. Barani, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, Tashidle, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here. Uh, Dr. Lobsang Sangela, Pamela Nodubla, all of the uh, members of parliament, both here based in North America and also based in India. It is truly a pleasure to have you here and to also to open your statement speaking Tibetan, which is very important in a matter of uh, some uh, controversy the last time we discussed Tibet at this uh, committee. Um, I wanted to say, uh, as you know, that I'm the representative of a community that is uh, the pride of uh, the Tibetan Canadian community. Uh, there are 7,000 constituents in my riding of Parkdale High Park. I take their concerns very seriously, both as their representative but also as the chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Tibet. Uh, I wanted to ask you a number of questions, uh, but the first one I wanted to start with, uh, Dr. Sange, was dovetails with uh, the appearance of uh, Pema Wangdu, also uh, uh, goes by the name of Bama Wangdui, who is here at the committee speaking about um, the situation of Tash Tashi Wangchuk. So that's the Tibetan individual who was detained in 2016, indicted in 2017 on charges of quote unquote inciting separatism. As you know, his alleged crime was advocating for the cultural rights of Tibetans to study in their own language. His efforts to promote Tibetan language instruction were picked up by the New York Times. The government of Canada, our government, requested and was denied permission to attend his trial, which took place on January 4th. After the appearance uh, of uh, Pema Wangdu at this committee on May 22nd, he was actually sentenced to five years in prison. That prompted uh, our government to issue a statement uh, that was issued by the Embassy of Canada in China, which said this, that Mr. Tashi Wangchuk, I'm reading the statement, a Tibetan language adv advocate, was detained in January 2016 for peacefully raising concerns about the lack of Tibetan language education in Yushu County and sentenced on May 22, 2018 to five years in prison for inciting separatism. Canada calls on the government of China to release Tashi Wangchuk immediately and unconditionally. Canada urges the Chinese government to uphold its own constitution and laws and to respect its international human rights obligations. Canada supports the February 2018 United Nations Special Rapporteur's statement, which condemns the detention of Mr. Tashi Wangchuk as the criminalization of linguistic and cultural rights advocacy. Can you tell me, Dr. Sange, 
what is your view about the importance of Tibetan language instruction in the Tibetan Autonomous Region and the arrest and subsequent conviction and sentencing of Mr. Tashi Wangchuk? Um, thank you very much, Arif, uh, for the question. I know you've been the chair of uh, you know, uh, Parliament Friends of Tibet, and you are doing a very good job. And uh, uh, your statement um, and the video also went viral. <laughs> <laughs> and Tibetans appreciate a lot uh, for what you have done so far and uh, uh, urge you to continue uh, to uh, lead uh, the uh, support group in Canada. Uh, and I also appreciate, the, uh, appreciate when you use the word, Tibetan word, Tashi Dalek, which means good wishes. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Tibetan delegation from so-called Tibetan Autonomous Region could not speak in Tibetan. Uh, that speaks for itself because it's a language of colonial master. It's more convenient for them to speak in Chinese so that you know, uh, they can echo or parrot what the uh, Chinese governor wants uh, them to uh, speak. And there's nothing lost in translation so that when they go back, they don't land up in trouble. Uh, uh, as far as uh, Tashi Wong Chu is concerned, you know, essentially what he was advocating was allowed by the Chinese constitution and laws. Article 4 of the Chinese constitution clearly says, quote unquote, minorities should not only use their own language, but should be encouraged to use their own language. That's the law says. And Tashi Wangchu was essentially saying, Tibetan school should have Tibetan as a medium instruction, along with the Chinese medium instruction. So this is allowed and encouraged by the Chinese constitution. For advocating that, and which was covered by New York Times, and essentially which is you know, the largest and the most influential newspaper in the world, even after the coverage and advocacy, uh, he was sentenced to five years in prison for simply advocating what is legal, what is provided uh, in the uh, Chinese constitution. For Tibetans, Tibetan language is very important uh, because ultimately, I'm sure the delegation who came here, they always say Tibetans are master of their own region. Uh, if they are the master of their own region, Tibetan identity and Tibetan culture is essential. But uh, Tibetans are denied. And Tibetan language, you know, is essential component of Tibetan identity. If you, if you lose your language, essentially you lose an essential part of who you are, a Tibetan. Hence, by discouraging Tibetan language, for example, Tibet, the medium of instruction in college level, at high school level, middle school level, is all in Chinese. It's part of the cultural assimilation that over time they want to make Tibet into a Chinatown and Tibetan into Chinese, and the first thing is to discourage uh, Tibetan language. As you know, 98% of Tibetan monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns were disrobed in the 1960s to prevent them from practicing Buddhism or religion. Thank you, Dr. Sangha. I just want to ask another question. Uh, we also talked in the committee uh, about a month back about the Panchen Lama, uh, Gendin Choki Niyama. Um, who the Dalai Lama recognized when he was six years old as the 11th Panchen Lama in Tibet. A few days later after that recognition, he, he and his family were taken into custody by the Chinese, by the officials of the government of China. They have never been seen again. The, our government, the government of Canada, has requested information about the safety and whereabouts of Gendon Chokinima on several occasions dating back all the way to 1995. The United Nations has requested permission to visit this boy to verify his well-being. All of those requests have been denied. Most recently at this committee, several parliamentarians raised questions of the officials from TAR about uh, the Panchen Lama. We, they confirmed uh, indirectly that he is alive, which is a good thing, but access to him has still not been made available. Can you tell me, how does the unknown whereabouts of the Panchen Lama affect the Tibetan community that you represent? Gedin uh, Nyema or the Panchen Lama, recognized by Solonis Dalai Lama, reflects the you know, human rights situation in Tibet. At the age of five, he has disappeared. Now next year, it'll be 25 years since his disappearance, and he'll be 30 years, uh, simply for being recognized as a religious leader. 
you can't blame him for being recognized as religious leader by the committee appointed by the Chinese government, consisting of monks from Tashilumpu Monastery, which is the main monastery of Pension Lama. Um, now, uh, his whereabout is unknown, but what the Chinese government always say is he wants to remain private. He doesn't want to be disturbed. So that's why, you know, uh, they can't share with us where he is and what he's doing. If that is the case, then let his family members speak out. Let his family members come out and let them choose whether to reside in Canada or U.S. and speak for uh, Gendin Chok in Yema or Pension Lama. Or let him now, he is, you know, above the age of 18 where, you know, we all get the right to vote. And he is an adult. And let him come out and speak uh, what he wants to do. Unless we see him in person and hear him in person, we can't believe what the Chinese government is saying. So essentially the situation or the condition of Pension Lama encapsulates what is going on in Tibet. That is denial of religious freedom and basic human rights of an individual, which is to practice his own religion and become or remain as the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Sankai, for your presentation, which was most interesting. I often say, is the interpretation coming through? Can you hear the interpretation? I often say that we can learn from delegations that appear before us. Is the voice of the interpreter coming through? Yep. Okay, then. Merci. Thank you. As you See, I have the privilege of being able to express myself here in my mother tongue, which is French. Indeed. So I thank you for your presence here, the presence of your whole group. Sometimes when we hear delegations such as yours, we tell ourselves we could learn from them. So perhaps you could give us a, a lesson on uh, being polite during question period because you're saying that it's more polite in your country. I also wanted to mention that you mentioned problems with regard to access of Canadian officials. They're having difficulty going to Tibet, having access to Tibetans, and this is of grave concern to us, the fact that we can't go there. Last point, very quickly. Arif asked some of the questions that I had in mind, so I thank him for that because I realized that I would have five or six questions and unfortunately not enough time to cover them all. But if you could, I would like to hear you talk more about the notion of autonomy. What do you see in this autonomy? I'm a Quebecer. Quebec is a province that has its own regime within Canada. It does have some autonomy. So I would like to hear you more on this. How do you define this autonomy? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your question. And it's uh, beautiful to hear language. French is a beautiful language. And we do believe Tibetan language also quite beautiful, <laughs> which ought to be uh, preserved and which also needs its own space. Uh, in Tibet for uh, the Tibetan people. You're absolutely right. Going to Tibet is very difficult. Um, many members of parliament have made a request. Uh, in fact, the special rapporteur of the United Nations on Human Rights uh, made the request, and Chinese government agreed to allow him to visit Tibet. And his term is ending uh, in August, and uh, he's actually not allowed. Um, so you know, that's why I think there's a bill is being moved in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, on reciprocity, uh, which is to say Chinese uh, members of parliament, uh, Chinese officials, the journalists, and you know, scholars, uh, including uh, Tibetan delegation or the, you know, the, those who are propagandists, can come to Canada or Ottawa. But equal number or similar access should be given to 
Canadians as well, Canadian diplomats, Canadian members of parliament, scholars. So it's just a reciprocity, you know. You come to our place, you're welcome, but we should also go. Because Chinese delegation, whenever they come, they always say, unless you see the things for yourself, you won't know what's going on. So we don't trust your judgment or assessment because you have never been there. That's what they tell me all the time. But actually, I have been to Beijing uh, in 2006. They allowed me. I was just an academic at Harvard Law School. But then when I requested to go to Tibet, which is just three hours flight, they said, we don't have enough people to receive you in Lhasa. And as I've come to China, you have 1.3 billion people. Please don't tell me that you don't have enough people to receive me. But still, they didn't allow me. So I am a Tibetan. They always say you should go to Tibet, see for yourself. Then uh, you will appreciate uh, how good uh, the uh, Tibet is. But we all are denied that access. And uh, so it's very important uh, that we insist that Chinese are welcome to Canada, but the you know, Canadian members of parliament and diplomats in, in, in Beijing should have access to Tibet as well. Now, as far as autonomy is concerned, I think what we are asking is, a uh, little less than Quebec, in fact. Um, what we are essentially saying is what is written in the Chinese constitution as far as minorities and Tibetans are concerned be implemented. The Tibetans have their own language, Tibetans have their own culture, Tibetans have their own administration. So these are the things what we are asking for, including education. So if the Chinese government implement their own laws, we could take that as autonomy. And in fact, we have submitted a document called Memorandum of Genuine Autonomy um, in 2008. Uh, unfortunately, the Chinese government uh, has uh, denied uh, uh, the implementation of those uh, rights. So essentially, you know, uh, autonomy means Tibetan language, Tibetan culture, Tibetan education, and administration uh, of the region uh, by Tibetans themselves. I'm also curious as to your parliament. You have an opposition within your parliament? So I have a question for you. A politician's question. What distinguishes present, the present-day government and the opposition policy-wise? The Tibetan parliament acts both as the opposition and ruling party. Uh, so they all uh, are elected on a regional basis, and they, mostly they all act as individuals. So there is no opposition party per se. So our democracy is party-less democracy. The, it's, it's a Buddhist notion and also a practical idea that if there is a political party uh, in a country, the political party sometimes, um, you know, acts more for party's interest than national interest or common interest. Sometimes, <laughs> so that's why, you know, hence ours is partyless democracy. So we all act for national interests, uh, and then you know the party interests. So that's the idea. So it's in a way uh, Buddhist way of you know having consensus in all the decisions, which is very difficult. Uh, but that's on that basis we are moving forward. So far, it's working. Uh, democracy without borders is working. So don't, don't give ideas to members of parliament to have opposition. You know, if there's true opposition in the government, we, the executive, will be in the receiving end. <laughs> that's very interesting. Varani, uh, please. Uh, Dr. Sangi, uh, I wanted to continue along a bit of a theme, so Hélène took one of my questions, so touché, madame. Uh, donc, uh, so the, but the issue of the reciprocation is an important one, and it's been raised in different contexts by the Canadian Parliament and parliamentarians from many sides on a number of occasions. But, and we had uh, Mr. Pema Wangdu, again, uh, Mr. Baimai Wangdui, here, and what he said was, quote, the door will only be more and more open to the outside world, end quote. He also said, quote, I do believe that you have a good chance to go to Tibet and have a look at it. And I think what is frustrating is that we know that there are Canadian-funded entities uh, and Canadian-funded programs that are existing in the TAR. 
Um, so can you uh, just elaborate a bit on your answer? I'll ask you two questions, but can you elaborate a bit on your response to Madame Laverdier in the context of where uh, a, a government, whether it's a Canadian government or any other government, is having their funds uh, delivered or uh, promoting projects on the ground in TAR, and yet access isn't permitted? And then the second point is just about the about the middle way approach. And I'm glad you started with this at the outset, uh, Dr. Sange, because the more I learn about it, the more innocuous it seems, right? There are people that will characterize it as radical, revolutionary, independent, separatist ideas. And then when you understand it and read it, it is about mutual existence, mutual cooperation. It is about existing uh, with Tibetan uh, uh, autonomy within a broader Chinese federation. And like you said, it's very similar to many parts of the world, including what we have here in Canada. Um, it's also a very peaceful initiative that was commenced by the Dalai Lama many decades before. So if you could elaborate a bit on why you think uh, the notion of the middle way has been uh, altered or is being interpreted in ways that characterize it vastly different from the way I've just described. And the, and the last point, Dr. Sang, is if you could just touch on this current status of what we call the Sino-Tibetan dialogue, so that Chinese-Tibetan dialogue. You yourself mentioned you had been in Beijing. I understand that from 2002 to 2010, there were as many as nine different rounds of negotiations, and then those negotiations came to an abrupt halt. Why did that abrupt halt occur, and what can be done to resurrect that dialogue? Because certainly as Canadians, I think our diplomacy over a series of decades has always been about brokering dialogue between different communities around the planet. So how can that dialogue be resurrected, and what can parliamentarians do to help? Thank, uh, you. thank you for those very good questions. Um, as you mentioned, the name of the uh, delegate who came and uh, made the presentation. But we all must know uh, that there are few Tibetans uh, who are sent around to speak on behalf of the Chinese government or parrot their propaganda. But in the last 60 years, the most powerful person, in, even in Tibet autonomous region, uh, that's party secretary of the Communist Party, has never been a Tibetan. Even at a prefecture level, or at a county level, it's very rare uh, to have a Tibetan as a party secretary. So a Tibetan could be equally qualified, equally credentialed, but the post is always given to Chinese. So hence, those who come here and speak uh, supposedly for Tibetan people, actually, in actuality, they don't have power uh, or authority uh, in uh, <laughs> Tibetan areas. Um, yes, you are right. It's just not just the Canadian government or the American government, others who have provided funding for projects inside Tibet uh, for transparency's sake, to evaluate and assess how the projects are going, whether it's beneficial or not, is very difficult, very important for in the uh, Canadian officials uh, or the NGOs to go to the area and assess, but they are denied permission. Um, hence. Uh, that's the tragedy. On the one hand, they accept the funding. On the other hand, you will never know whether the project is implemented or not. Um, hence, you know, it's in clear violation of international norms or an agreement with that government. When we provide funding for a project, we must see where the money is going. So that is being truly uh, denied. And I think we all must uh, push uh, that as, uh, access be given, hence reciprocity, you know, not in terms of numbers that, you know, three Chinese officials came here, hence three Canadians must go. It's not in terms of number, exact number, but the idea is you come and we should go too. Um, now, as far as middle way approach is concerned, you're right, you know, I've had hundreds and hundreds and rounds of debates with Chinese students and scholars. And when we explain to them, middle way approach does not seek or challenge sovereignty of China, does not challenge China's territorial integrity. It essentially means genuine autonomy as per Chinese laws and to remain within China. So that's why the Obama administration said we support middle way approach because this does not contradict one China policy. But the Chinese government and Chinese officials always say, oh, middle way approach is hidden independence, or there's something hidden. And Dalai Lama is always split. He say he is the most liked and most trusted person in the whole world. 
But it's just the Chinese government and Chinese leaders who don't trust him, you see. As don't you see it's your problem when the whole world trusts Dalai Lama? And if you are not trusting, don't you think there's something wrong with your mindset, right? And, uh, and if you go with that mindset of distrust, then I remember saying, you know, even if His Holiness Dalai Lama goes to the caves of Himalayan mountains or in a submarine deep in the ocean, Chinese government leaders will still say, no, he's cooking up something up in the mountain or he's cooking up something deep in the sea, you see. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it's the lack of trust. Hence, they try to spin and spin around and, and not accept middle way as a win-win proposition, win for China and win for Tibetan people as well, because China is becoming a world power. But, you know, you can have military or money power. But if you want to have moral authority, if you want to win respect, you must respect the fundamental rights of the Tibetan people. Unless you do that, you will not gain credibility and respect from the international community. So for China also is a lot to gain, because Tibet is essentially is a litmus test for China and also for Canada. Because China says we implement and respect rule of law and human rights. If that is the case, then you should see the situation in Tibet, a middle way approach uh, or genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people uh, should be uh, implemented. And also for Canada, because Canada has true values, moral values and human rights values. If Canada is for these rights or values, then one should speak out for uh, Tibetan uh, people as well. And Tibetans have been nonviolent and peaceful for decades. In that sense, we have been good guys in the whole world. You know, sometimes good guys don't get rewarded, but we would like some uh, piece of reward for being good. Um, because if you look at the conflicts in Syria or in Africa, Boko Haram, you just name it, everywhere in the whole world, they all are watching which model to follow. IS violent model to follow, or a militant Buddhist model to follow, or a non-violent peaceful model, the Tibetan model to follow. Now, if much is talked about violence and conflicts, the other conflict area will say, let's follow the violent model, because that gets more attention, that gets more headlines, and that gets you know, more support. And if non-violent peaceful model of the uh, Tibetan people is not supported, then essentially, by default, you are encouraging violence and you are encouraging uh, terrorism and you know militancy around the world so for being a good guy um, I think we deserve some attention support as well but the fact that this committee is holding this hearing essentially is a support for good guys so for which we are very very uh, appreciated as far as sino tibetan dialogue is concerned um, yes the envoys of the Dalai Lama met with the Chinese representative for nine rounds from 2002 to 2009. It's not like there's no talk going on. There were talks uh, between the envoys of Dalai Lama and Chinese representative, but there was no breakthrough. Uh, the final uh, talk was, the dialogue was in January of 2010. Now, it's been eight years, there's been no dialogue between uh, two sides, and hopefully, uh, with a nudge uh, from the uh, Canadian government leaders, uh, there could be some uh, breakthrough as well. I know uh, Canada is uh, negotiating or talking about trade agreement. And essentially, it's very important to have trade relationship with uh, China, but it's equally important that one must speak for human rights so the money and moral go together and one is not exchanged for the other. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jesneski, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for appearing before our committee. Um, in 1981, the Communist Party declared that the great proletarian revolution, and this is the quote, was responsible for the most severe setback and the heaviest losses suffered by the party, country, and the people since the founding of the People's Republic. Uh, yet, they never talked about Tibet, that rare sort of moment of acknowledgement of the horrors of Communist Party uh, rule. Um, I believe it was mentioned of 6,200 monasteries that existed. Only six survived. That's less than 0.1% of thousands of uh, Tibetan, uh, 600,000 Tibetan monks and nuns by 1979, virtually all 
had been murdered, disappeared. Uh, often they were labeled monsters and uh, demons. Yet this policy of uh, ethnocide uh, seems to uh, continue um, under the current regime. Uh, in 2016, over 2,000 Buddhist monks and nuns were expelled from the largest uh, Buddhist institute, the Larungar, um, and you had referenced the desperation of Buddhist monks uh, and nuns. 150 have self-immolated. Buddhism, Buddhism is central to your identification um, as a people, uh, but you also reference it's no longer the one road. Mm -hmm. There are now many roads. Mm -hmm. There are planes, there are trains, there are, uh, there's a wholesale populating, uh, repopulation of Tibet that's going on. Uh, so time seems of the essence. Um, how do you react to that particular reality? Because it, it seems like the situation is no longer just desperate. Um, it, it's almost at the point of not being recoverable. How much time is there? Time is of the essence. Um, is Chinese government plan is to uh, convert Tibet into Chinatown and uh, through cultural assimilation make Tibetans into Chinese. That's why they're discouraging Tibetan language uh, in schools as a medium of instruction and so on and so forth. Uh, and then through trains, through railway line and through airports and through many other roads, uh, they have you know, physically uh, control uh, uh, Tibet and Tibetan people. But at the same time, Tibetan struggle is a struggle of resilience and determination of the Tibetan people. Um, because you're absolutely right, 98% of those 6,000 plus monasteries were destroyed. 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns were disrobed in 1950s and 60s. But 60 years hence, what has happened is that Buddhism is back in Tibet, in private social space. Government policy is to destroy, systematically destroy, hence you rightfully pointed out, Larungar Monastery with 12,000 monks and nuns was demolished from August of 2016 to August of 2017 and reduced to 5,000 monks and nuns. That is further divided into two parts. One is spiritual part and one is academic part as per the report of Human Rights Watch. And they have stationed 200 communist cadres to control and monitor ins and outs of uh, Larungar. And as we speak, Yashingar with five plus thousand nuns is being demolished. Um, and this is the reality. But from 98% destruction, back in Tibet, now Buddhist monasteries are back. In exile, Buddhist monasteries have been rebuilt and revived. And, and there are Buddhist centers all over the world, uh, including in Canada. Now, oddly, China has become the largest Buddhist country in the world. 300 to 400 million Chinese are practicing Buddhism. So if there, if there was a competition between Dalai Lama and Mao Zedong, you can clearly see after 60 years, Dalai Lama has worn hands down. From complete destruction, revival of Buddhism among exiled Tibetans around the world, back in Tibet, and also in China. So I'm sure Mao Zedong must be thinking, I destroyed everything that is Buddhism in Tibet. Now Buddhism has come back uh, in China with full force. So that's why it's a struggle of resilience. Tibetans are nonviolent, peaceful, but we also have the mountain spirit or determination. Peacefully, quietly, we keep fighting step by step and get to where we want to go. And essentially also, you know, even though you said you know, time might be against us, we think time is with us because fundamentally our struggle is based on Buddhism, which is 2,600 years old, and communism is 100 years old. There is no competition between the two. You know, so if Buddhism has prevailed for 2,600 years, it will be there for another 2,500 years. So with communism gone in Cuba, 
with Raul Castro is holding on it, and with Kim Jong Un signing the treaty, if North Korea also goes, then I think China will be the only so-called communist but market economy country, you know, in the whole world. And we do believe that Buddhism will again prevail, and peace will also prevail uh, uh, in in the uh, Tibetan plateau. But the Chinese government uh, efforts to ethnocide essentially you know, destroy anything Buddhist and anything Tibetan uh, is continuing. And the uh, population transfer of a lot of Chinese coming to Tibetan plateau and dominating uh, economy and market is also true. For example, in the capital city of uh, Tibet, Lhasa, I think 80, if not 90 percent of shops, hotels, restaurants are owned or run by Chinese. And in fact, in 1980s, the, there were signboards, and the practice is also true, that it says they're hiring, and if you are Tibetan, they give you, you know, 30 RMB a day, and if you are Chinese, they give you 50 RMB a day. Essentially saying, if there's a signboard in Ottawa in a shop that says, if you're Chinese, we give you 50 Canadian dollars a day. If you are Tibetan or a Canadian, they give you 30, you know, Canadian dollars a day. And that kind of blatant discrimination uh, still uh, going on uh, in Tibet. So this is, in some ways, a systematic effort to discourage and destroy the identity and very foundation of the uh, Tibetan people and Tibet. But the resilience uh, of the Tibetan people lives on and still very strong. So we have done it with the revival of Buddhism, and we will do it uh, politically as well. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Senge. Now, colleagues, uh, we're going to go a little over time because we want to finish the second round. So Mr. Jenis is going to go, and then Mr. Sani, and that'll wrap it up. So uh, Garnet, uh, yourself, and uh, Mr. Sani. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to pick up on a couple things that have been discussed so far. Uh, so I'll mention them in a row at the beginning again here, here quickly. Um, this issue of the religious question, my sense is that we're seeing a, the religious suppression in China change in its form, but still very much there. Historically, it was trying to stamp out religion. Now it's the government trying to co-opt and control uh, religion. Uh, I think you know we see it with regard to their uh, their approach to uh, prospective reincarnation. Uh, it's the the only atheist regime in the world that also wants to control reincarnation. So this is, uh, I guess it's like, it's like um, democracy with Chinese characteristics. This is reincarnation with atheistic characteristics. So, but I, I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, on this, on the ongoing uh, suppression, repression of religion, but in, in, a, in a different form. Um, I, I wanted to ask if you think we should be funding projects inside of Tibet. Uh, I could see taxpayers wondering, you know, if we're not even able to monitor and see the results, how do we know that the money's ending up in Tibet at all? But of course, the people of Tibet need need help and support and, and face very difficult circumstances. So is there is there a way that we can help people inside of Tibet um, and, and yet know that we're actually doing that? Uh, and finally, I wonder if you can comment on some of the overall trend lines with respect to Tibet and human rights in China. Um, we it was discussed that there was a dialogue happening that's no longer happening. Are there other areas in which we see a worsening of the situation? Uh, are there areas in which we see positive trends, trend lines? Um, what, what, uh, what are we looking at in terms of that? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for those questions. Um, you know, as far as funding inside Tibet is concerned, I think we all must, you know, we encourage uh, any funding that can help Tibetan people inside Tibet, because you can reach out to those villages and those community uh, where funding is needed, where schools are needed and hospitals are needed. They have to be educated and they have to be treated well and culture be preserved. So any funding um, that's being provided by the Canadian government or any government around the world, we always encourage and appreciate those uh, efforts and. Uh, um, as far as uh, reincarnation, you're right. Reincarnation with atheist characteristic is true because uh, in 2008, Chinese government has come out with uh, guidelines, eight-point guidelines, that says that any reincarnation of a monk 
uh, has to be registered and approved by the Communist Party, the District Communist Party. So, I mean, can you imagine uh, that, you know, uh, the stamp of, you know, atheist party is needed for a spiritual practice and spiritual um, leaders. Um, similarly, they are planning uh, for what we call the, re the reincarnation of the Dalai Lamas as well. But as I told you, if you look at the track record of 98% of monasteries and nunneries being destroyed, 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns being disrobed, and you know, uh, and they call His Holiness Dalai Lama, uh, you know, a wolf in sheep clothing, you know, and devil and all that. With that kind of track record, I think the Chinese government has no credibility whatsoever in, you know, endorsing or recognizing uh, reincarnation. It's almost like you know. Kim Jong-un recognizes uh, next pope and expecting all the Catholics to say, oh, yes, we got the next pope because uh, a communist leader recognized uh, the pope, you know. So that much of lack of credibility is with the Chinese government when it comes to uh, reincarnation. Um, they are trying to co-opt and control religion in Tibet and as well as in China as well. Now, overall, what is disturbing is that in Tibet they have impose a grid system or a social credit uh, system where you know the citizens have to give security to get subsidies uh, essentially you know uh, the one has to report or spy on your neighbors uh, to get your essential uh, subsidies like sending your you know, children to school or any kind of facilities from the uh, Chinese government and they have also issued uh, ID card with you know second generation biometric chips in it. So once you swipe it, your movements are tracked. Uh, and in, uh, for example, in Lhasa, every 30 or 40 meters there's a check post. So anyone who wants to go to the market, you have to swipe your uh, ID card and your movements are tracked. Now they have built a sophisticated software or algorithm whereby they have tracked now uh, the pilgrims from remote villages and nomadic area visit some of the places in Tibet, once you swipe your ID card, your movements are tracked. And accordingly, they come to conclusion that nomadic area or that village might be problematic because most of the nomads or farmers have traveled to various places in Tibet. So that's a very, very sophisticated system. And it is working so well that the party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region was sent to Xinjiang autonomous region to implement the same grid system. This is being researched and reported by Human Rights Watch and also other uh, think tanks as well. Now, in Xinjiang also, that system is working so well, the party secretary of Xinjiang is promoted in the Politburo. That's 20 members leadership of China. Now, China has so many provinces, so many cabinet ministers, but to reach the top 20, you must have done something very, very good for the Chinese government. Hence, the party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region, now in Xinjiang, is among the top 20 because of the sophisticated system. Now, what is worrying for Canada, what should worry for Canada and the rest of the world is this software and algorithm will be sold to despots and dictators around the world. And they will use that uh, software to control their own people. So Chinese are very good in marketing and selling their products, and this product will be in the market soon. So hence, what is happening in Tibet will happen to you. Thank you, Dr. Sangi. Now we're going to go to Mr. Sani, and that will wrap up our questions for today. Uh, Raj? Thank you very much for all of you coming. Dr. Sangi, just as a point of information for you, I was born 125 miles, or kilometers, sorry, from Dharamsala, a small town called Mundi in Himachapa there. So, oh, yes. Yeah, so you probably know that. So I'm very familiar with the presence uh, in India. The question, I actually don't have a question. I have actually an opinion that I wanted to ask of you. If you look at what's happening in Tibet right now, you know, I mean, there's cer certain things that are happening overtly, and there's certain things that are happening subtly. When we talk about, about the Belt and Road Initiative or the construction of airports, it seems to be that successively there's more, a greater and greater impact of China in Tibet. If you look at also the fact that two million nomads from Tibet have been now moved into the urban areas. So that's another attempt to disrupt that way of life. 
But the question I had, you know, also if you look at the countries surrounding there, there's cooperation agreements that have been signed to make sure that exile groups are, are controlled or, or watched. The question I have is if you look at the question of succession, it seems to me there's, there's a diametrically opposed view. China wants to know who the successor is, and the Dalai Lama has said that that will be a religious question that will be solved. Now, according to the Dalai Lama's own comments, he's now, I think, I believe, 80 or, 80 or 81 years old. He said that question, that question will be answered either in my late 80s or, or when I'm 90. But that period of time when there is a sort of thought that there will be a successor and the successor is not known yet, and I know this is a very um, philosophical question, does not, not give China more time to, to have a greater impact in Tibet when there is an understanding that there will be another leader after the Dalai Lama? What is your opinion on that? That sort of, because you have a parallel track, you have a religious track where they don't know who the next Dalai Lama is, and you have China who's asking you that we have to approve the next successor. So it seems to me when that person emerges, there will be a conflict at that point in time because China will want to know what the bona fides of that successor are, but that successor will not be chosen until the right and appropriate time. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the question, very good question, and uh, good to see someone from the neighborhood. <laughs> um, uh, you're right, I think the, with infrastructure, the Chinese migration, they're trying to do the best to uh, assimilate uh, Tibet into China, but so far it has not worked for two reasons. Um, that is, Tibet is, it's called Tibetan Plateau, it's roof of the world, because on average it's 4,000 meters high. So it's very, very cold in winter. So Chinese people, they come to Tibet during summer, and they have to leave Tibet during winter. <laughs> you know, so even Tibetans, uh, you know, took thousands of years to climb from 3,000 meters high to 4,000 meters, because wheat cannot grow in 4,000 meters, only 3,000. So we discovered barley, hence we moved up, and yaks also came along. And that's how we survive on the Tibetan plateau. So that took us 3,000 years. So now Chinese will also take 3,000 years to genetically adapt to the Tibetan mountains, then only they can survive. So we have 3,000 years with us. Uh, so in that sense, you know, it's true. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, 70% uh, uh, of the Tibetan area is still nomadic and rural areas where Chinese infiltration and presence is very less and it's also very difficult. Uh, so in that sense, we have some time, around 3,000 years with us, you know. So it's a challenge. But in the urban areas where there are more developments, uh, where there are better infrastructure, Chinese are moving uh, for a longer period of time. But that's where the blatant discrimination is also happening, including in hiring and employment, even Tibetans who have worked for Communist Party, who are loyal Communist Party members, they are never promoted to party secretary at prefecture or county level, even though ed educated Christians credentialed. So they feel the discrimination. For example, in 2008, uh, just before the Olympics, when there was a major protest all over Tibet, nationwide protest. So CCTV wanted you know, a few Tibetan scholars, quote unquote scholars, to come on you know, Chinese television to propagate their version of the story. So they were flew from Tibet to Beijing. When they went to hotel to check in, which was booked by CCTV, they were told that, oh, you can't stay in this hotel because you are Tibetan. You must stay in another hotel which is designated for Tibetans. Similarly, even the mid-level Communist Party members, when they go to Chengdu to stay in the usual hotel, they were told, you can't stay in this hotel, you have to stay in the other hotel. So even the intellectuals, the party members, feel discrimination, and you can imagine the people. Hence, one, hence 152 Tibetans who have burned themselves, who have committed self-immolation. It's an act of desperation, yes, but it's, it is also an act of determination. After 60 years, after three generations of Tibetans, sense of patriotism and feeling and passion for their cause, still very strong. Uh, so in that sense, you're right, Chinese government is doing uh, their best uh, to control, but they are not succeeding. Hence, we, are, we have this hearing and the delegation from uh, China also come and try to share their version as well. 
Now, as far as reincarnation is concerned, as I, as I shared with you, ultimately, it is for the Tibetan people to embrace the next Dalai Lama. And obviously, the next Dalai Lama that Tibetans will embrace will be the one recognized by us or the Dalai Lama, and not by the Chinese government, given their track record. So to assume that there is a, a rational progression where there will be two con candidates and there will be conflict, uh, I think it's a fallacy because the other candidate will have no credibility whatsoever. As I said, it's almost like Kim Jong-un saying, this is my pope and all the Catholics should follow. I doubt there will be anyone who will be following that. No, I didn't mean two candidates. Mm. I meant the candidate that finally emerges. Mm. That person may not be acceptable. That's two. What I mean. Not two candidates, but that the one candidate or the one person that the Dalai Lama um, conveys that this is the next Dalai Lama, that person may not be acceptable to everyone. How would you... Uh, uh, that, that. that will be acceptable to 6 million Tibetans. That's good for us. Even now, the present Dalai Lama is not acceptable to the Chinese government, but it's acceptable to us and 6 million Tibetans inside Tibet. And that's the crux of the issue. You know? So again, it's about Buddhism, it's about spirituality, and the, the one recognized by Dalai Lama will be embraced by Tibetans. And ultimately, the spirituality is a matter of heart, it's a matter of faith. You can't force anyone on faith. Uh, you cannot buy anyone of faith. You have to believe it, and it comes from heart. And for the last 60 years, Tibet inside Tibet have faith and loyalty to His Holiness Dalai Lama. That's why 152 Tibetans who have committed self-immolation, they have two slogans. One, restore freedom for Tibetans and return of His Holiness Dalai Lama to Tibet. This is third generation of Tibetans are still asking for return of His Holiness Dalai Lama uh, to uh, Tibet. At the same time, as per His Holiness Dalai Lama's vision, in 2011, he separated the church and the state, and he delegated all his political authority to the elected leadership, which happens to be me and the parliament at that time. So we also have two track. There's a spiritual track and the democratic track. And among you know, 60 million refugees and diaspora around the world, perhaps Tibetan democracy, I think, is a role model. Uh, it's a well-practiced, uh, implemented democracy that you can see. So that's um, what we are practicing. And you know, perhaps on this issue of reincarnation, uh, U.S. Senate uh, recently passed a unanimous resolution uh, saying that reincarnation is the business of the Tibetan people. The next Dalai Lama will be recognized by Dalai Lama and no one else, and Chinese government has no role whatsoever. Uh, if this committee, perhaps uh, ideally by the Canadian Parliament, if there is a similar resolution saying spirituality is a matter of Tibetan people and reincarnation of Dalai Lama should be you know, um, decided by the Dalai Lama, it's a fair uh, kind of uh, a resolution. So if that happens, it will be very good. So our democracy is a genuine democracy, you know, so there is no uh, Tibetan characteristic, it's a universal characteristic. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sange. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up today, I mean, I appreciate uh, my colleagues uh, letting us go over time today. I think it was well worth it to listen to uh, uh, not only the executive, but our members of parliament who are here, and I have to admit it's the most polite group I've ever met as parliamentarians. Uh, and uh, we should take note of that, colleagues, as uh, we work our way through. So again, uh, thank you, and it's been very useful. Uh, this committee uh, will uh, take the information that we received today uh, from you as witnesses, and uh, a report will be forthcoming. So very much appreciate uh, this opportunity to dialogue with you. Colleagues, thank you very much, and the meeting's adjourned. See you on Thursday.